So now we'll look at um, how gas is used across Europe. As you can see from these um, figures here, primarily um, the usage of gas is, is um, in, in three main areas. One is um, power input, as you can see here, and then we have industrial loads, um, there's a little bit of transportation use in there, and also there's kind of resident and commercial use. The key to understanding this is the kind of the characteristics of the way that gas is actually used um, as time goes through. So typically power stations, depending on whether or not they're going to be seen as, as baseload or whether or not there's going to be peaking, um, will be um, a fairly constant um, delivery. There'll be some seasonality between winter and summer because we use more electricity in winter. And certainly if they're being used as peaking, they'll be used much more in winter. Industry tends to be a flatter load. It doesn't tend to vary so much during the year and it's tend to be used in, in kind of process. Whereas in the residential and commercial side, which we can see is very dominant in this area, that is very seasonal. It's mainly used in, in heating and hot water. So therefore we're likely to see much more use in winter than we are in summer. So when we're talking about therefore gas for heating, we're looking at the effect of external factors such as the temperature. So if it's a cold day, we're likely to see more gas being used. We then get from that what we call the S-curve. And the S-curve gives our kind of demand profile. As we see here, um, at the lowest temperatures, um, the temperatures fall to a certain level. There can be no additional supply in there and there is no additional demand. It's essentially, demand is maxed out. And actually, at the very, very high ends, you may even get demand destruction. At the highest temperatures, there comes a point when the temperature is as such that you can't turn off anymore. So it's just very, very basic sort of heating load. Uh, it's very, very basic sort of hot water load and very little gas for heating. The gradient between the A and B, which is the kind of the switching time, is where the demand actually rises as, as it gets cooler. And sort of traditionally, sort of as we move into winter, we'll move up that curve. Basically, that gradient the A and B will depend very much where you are in location. So you know, in the northern uh, part of Northwest Europe and the UK, uh, you may see that um, be relatively steep than you would do in, uh, in, in more southern parts and sort of southern part of France, for example. Gas for process load is used as part of the manufacturing process. We do have certain effects in this that we need to take into account, but the weather effect is less and therefore it's more likely to relate to the shift patterns. We use, it can be used in a number of areas. It can be used as heat in, in the steel industry, paint drying, for example, in car manufacturing, in drying for brick manufacturing and so on and so forth, even as far as sort of fertilizer production and, and, and what have you. But what you'll actually get within this is these sort of five day shift patterns so you'll get greater use during the working day than you do over the non-working day. So typically that again can be reflected in the prices where we tend to get cheaper prices over the weekend because the demand is lower. If we then combine this with heating, we obviously then get those patterns going forward um, over, over the winter. What I have here is a breakdown of um, UK demand over the last kind of full um, gas year. As you can see, this kind of builds up from the um, main kind of LDZ offtake, which is the gray area in there, and that represents really our heating load. You can then see the addition of the load driven by the, the power stations, and also the um, storage injections as well. So this is the time when we're taking gas and we're putting it into storage rather than withdrawing it from storage. On top of that, we've also got interconnector exports. Now there's a, there's a base load for those interconnector exports, which is across from the UK into, into Ireland. But also there's times when we're exporting gas over into the European market, when the UK exports through the interconnector between um, Bacton and, um, and Zeebrugge, where uh, gas is currently being exported. So that gives an additional load onto the market. What we can do is stack this up in terms of where the highest um, demand days are. And we can see here over that period, that highest demand day got up to about 400 MCM. And we can see the buildup of where that um, 
demand actually came from. So we can see at this point here, there was very, very little storage injection because you've probably got storage withdrawal at that point. You've got a fairly benign kind of industrial layer there um, and the, the interconnector exports, so at the much lower demand with probably import at the higher um, end. And then of course, we've got our, our power station demand. We can see the effect here of where that um, demand actually comes from. So just looking at the converse of that, if we look at the, the flow response to that, where the demand is actually coming from, we can see here just broken down quite simply into, into beach flows, which will include um, import from Norway. It will also look at uh, the LNG deliveries, um, where import is coming from the interconnector to sort of make up the, um, uh, the flow. So this will be reverse flow from um, or, or, flow from Zbrugge to, to Bacton, but also Balzag Bacton. And so you can see here at those very sort of peak days where, where that's actually part of our, our overall response. And of course, these yellow areas at the top are the effects of the storage flow into the network. So it's the withdrawal from storage. If we then look at that in the same way and we stack it up to meeting that highest price, um, highest demand day there at 400, we can see how these flows are being met and the proportion of, of the beach flows, including flows from Norway, the LNG import, the imports through the interconnector and the withdrawal from storage. So what we can do from that is actually identify what we call a supply stack. The prices that we see across the UK market here and fact across them, all European markets, we can divide up to sort of see where the flows are going to come from according to what the market conditions are. So from that, we can potentially identify where the marginal gas price is set. So when we talk about the marginal gas price, we're talking about what do we have to pay to gain additional flows. So if we look at this as a supply stack with our, our base load production and our long-term import at the bottom, we've got LNG in there, we've got the swing contracts, so those in the, in the North Sea or, or from Norway that are able to sort of ramp up and ramp down according to demand, short-term import and indeed storage. What we can do here is actually see where the demand is gonna come from, um, where the supply is gonna come from according to demand. So if we look, Again, here on the left-hand side, we can say, okay, we've got adequate supply uh, relating to import uh, long-term, the LNG, the swing contracts, some short-term import in the production. But in order to gain additional supply, we've got to look at the cost of attracting that from an alternative market. So potentially you're looking at import from a neighboring country or the withdrawal from storage or the potential um, impact of uh, ramping up a swing contract in order to meet that demand. Trading and hedging in European markets. That's the second uh, version of this. One, two, three. So what we're going to look at now is, is uh, making use of storage and, and the trading plays that are done around the um, storage mechanisms. It depends very much on the type of storage that's um, available to you or the type of storage you're using. So if the storage is only small, short-term, fast response, you're only looking for those kind of short-term opportunities. And if it's a longer-term um, response, such as you sort of get in Germany with um, you know, the, the big storage like Raiden and so on, the opportunities become more seasonal. So you're looking to inject during the summer months and then withdraw during the peak times in winter. What you then do with that is you're looking at the optimization and use of the extrinsic value of storage to create any additional value. So if we look here as an example of short-term storage, we're looking very much at the short-term arbitrage. So we saw here the example potentially um, in October, we have lower prices at the front and higher prices at the back. So we looked at this previously in terms of a swing contract, or ramping, uh, turning down uh, production, replacing from MBB, and then turning up production at the other end um, and, and buying and selling to, to manage the price there. What you're doing here with storage is actually at the lower prices you'll be injecting with a view to be withdrawing at the end of the month when you get the higher prices. Of course, when you, when you do that, the, the um, gas that you're buying to inject at the lower prices, you're then at the same time selling that forward price as well to ensure that you get the margin between the two. Seasonal storage is slightly more um, 
complex because we're talking with much, much larger volumes. So in this period, you're looking to inject over that storage period in the summer here, and that will be very much dependent, obviously, at the makeup of the storage. But then you'll be looking to initially to look at that period there, which is the first quarter of the following year, the second quarter of the winter. That will be the highest price quarter. In order to hedge the value between the two, when you're buying the gas to inject over the summer, you're also selling that Q1 period and that locks in the spread between the two. Primary value therefore in the seasonal storage is in summer injection. And the primary withdrawal is seen as January to March and that will depend very much on, on what the number of days of send out of storage you're allowed and what the relationship between withdrawal and injection and storage is. But what you're looking to do is as you come into the winter, you look to optimize those delivery days to maximize the withdrawal on those highest price days. And that'll also enable you to, um, or, or should be doing at that stage, is also using the markets to actually protect the margins that you have and also to fulfill your supply obligations. So when we look at the extrinsic value and optimizing storage, the decision, some of the decisions you have to take as to how to manage your facility are going to relate to things like what the level of current inventory is so what is it in relation to um, using uh, future requirements there might be uh, questions about the number of contract days remaining you might not be injecting if you haven't got any days to withdraw at the end of the contract you're looking at the current prices versus the future prices is it better to withdraw now and or and supply from the market later on because you have that uh, price differential there could also be very simple things such as take other take or pay contracts that you need to fulfill over time. So the understanding of storage of part of the wider portfolio becomes essential. You've got to ensure that natural gas is not stranded at the end of the contracts and also by hedging the transactions and ensuring that supply commitments are met are essential to maintaining the value.